Yep, can you remove my box, please? Can you remove your box, please? Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will begin in just a minute with National Borders and Identity. Please. It'll turn Hello, everyone. For I'm those of you just joining us, welcome Anna. to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. So Our go next. ahead and kick it off and introduce herself and the panelists. Hi, I'm for tuning in. I'm so honored to be here. Uh, my name is Anna Blender and our panel is called National Borders and Identity. And just like the purpose uh, of this conference and our hope today is that you come out of this conversation really challenging assumptions of what identity is, uh, the role that nations and borders play or should play. Um, and as the host eloquently said, you know, this is a really unique day. Um, not only are we here together in this digital world, um, you know, rendering borders in some ways today irrelevant, it's also Juneteenth. Um, and so it's never been more important to have these kinds of conversations, to challenge assumptions, to institute long-term systematic change. And so this is not the last panel that we're gonna have an identity um, at the conference. Um, and if, with this one, what we really wanna do is take a step back and think about the foundation of identity as it relates to nations, what it means to be of many places, what it means to be of none. Um, today, over a billion people are living without an official identity. And you know they're suffering, they're persecuted as a result, and it's become very clear that um, even those who do have an official identity, you know, are often persecuted not only in spite of it but because of it. Um, and so, what are the solutions? Um, what are the alternative paths forward? And we have an amazing um, set of panelists today um, that I'm going to introduce. Uh, we've got Zarina Agnew, who's joining us from the UK. She's a brilliant neuroscientist at Rational Labs. Um, she's founded numerous movements, um, and her passion for science underlies everything that she does. Uh, we've got Lorenzo Bustani. He's an entrepreneur who's been involved in so many fascinating um, and innovative ventures, and he's also the founder of Mandala, which is a social um, innovation consultancy. And we've got Alex um, Gladstein, who's the chief strategy office, officer of the Human Rights Foundation and the Oslo Freedom Forum. And in his work, Alex has connected hundreds of dissidents and civil society groups of business leaders, technologists, journalists, philanthropists, policymakers, and artists to promote free and open society. Um, and I think there's no, um, you know, there, this is a great panel to ask the question as a start, you know, to each of you, what do you see as identity? What do you see as your identity? Um, you know, how does it relate to the idea of the nation where you currently are or where you're from? Um, Serena, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Uh, and this is a great uh, team to be talking about this with. Um, you know, so I can speak to my um, sort of unearned given um, uh, national identity, if you like, which is an extremely privileged one. It is, uh, I have a British passport and an Australian passport, which can get you to most places in the world without much of a blink of an eyelid, which is an extraordinary experience. Um, I don't feel much affiliation to my um, my sort of given nation states. I think uh, the only thing that I can speak to about England that I really feel a sort of emotional attachment to is how it treats its people. Um, and that sort of manifests mostly in, in the NHS and its free services. Um, uh, so that's something I do feel sort of proud of. And it's interesting to know that I do feel proud of that as if somehow I've <laughs> got something to do with it. Um, I think for me, uh, identity has, my chosen uh, identity has, has very much come about from um, the communities in which I have uh, had self-determination that I have had to help curate. Um, and uh, I think that feels very different to me, the sort of chosen versus given set of identities. Uh, and that um, those chosen identities are very sort of nomadic. Um, I don't just mean in terms of uh, geography, but sort of culturally nomadic um, and sort of have like experimentation and iteration uh, at the core of them. What about you, Lorenzo? Can you speak a little bit to your identity? Of course, Anna, thanks for, for the invitation. Um, well, I'm the son of uh, two Brazilian diplomats. So I was born and raised in several different countries and it made it quite difficult for me to be very rigid 
uh, about the parameters through which I define my own identity. Uh, but because um, I think I was exposed to very different cultures um, throughout my entire upbringing and even after I gained my autonomy and uh, started working, I also jumped from place to place. Um, I think my sense of identity transcends uh, nationalistic principles. Uh, it's it's, it's of, of a more existential nature. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, the connections that you nurture with uh, people from all walks of life. Um, it's the extent to which you feel connected to a community that transcends your country. So it sounds a little cliche, but uh, I feel like I'm a citizen of the world, first and foremost. Um, and I think identity today um, also has to do with our um, connections, broken or not, um, with the natural systems that we rely on to sustain life. Um, so I think uh, today more than ever, um, that connection defines uh, who we are and what our perception of our role in the world is. Especially with that background, um, the wonderful countryside that really resonates. Um, thank you. Um, Alex, what about you? And you know, keeping in mind that you are the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation, um, you know, especially when, you know, as you stepped into that role in your work um, in social justice, um, how that might have shifted that identity as well. Yeah, I'm American, but at the Human Rights Foundation, I work with people from more than a dozen different countries, ranging from Guatemala to Lebanon to Hong Kong uh, to Mauritania. And it's a very stark reality when you start organizing events and inviting activists to meet each other in different places around the world. You realize how, um, let's say, unequal everyone is. Uh, I think Zarina was hinting at this earlier, but uh, if you're American or have a British or, you know, some sort of EU passport, it's very easy to move around. Uh, if you're from Syria, it's not so easy. And we go to great lengths to try and work with governments to try and bring people together in relatively neutral places like Norway. Um, but again, uh, there are a lot of stumbling blocks. Much suspicion is leveled at people simply because of where they're born. And I, I think what I'd like to focus on today is sort of the economic side of this usually your identity dictates um, your economic abilities. Uh, it, of course, it, it dictates also your ability to, to travel and your freedom of movement, which is something we can talk about. But I think probably more resonant and more relevant to people's daily lives is how it affects their economic abilities. And today there's, uh, as you said, more than a billion people who perhaps don't have something like a passport, but there's, there's more than 2 billion people who, who don't even have a bank account. And there's more than 4 billion people who live under an authoritarian government, uh, which can arbitrarily remove banking, um, you know, uh, abilities from its citizens if it doesn't like them, or if they're the wrong ethnicity or sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. So what's really interesting is that we've started to, as humans, develop technology that allow, allow us to transact with each other uh, in a permissionless way <laughs> that does not require governments to approve or doesn't give them the ability to control what we're doing. And that to me is a pretty big game changer when it comes to identity. Yeah, there, there definitely seems to be this theme of control of centralized power, um, you know, something that a lot of times results in authoritarianism. Um, how, you know, what are the tools that we have to actually implement the kind of change that shifts that control away? Um, I know it's happening in some places, but um, like Zarina, I know, for example, you've worked with creating some you know, new types of communities uh, that don't rely on those traditional systems. Um, can you talk a little bit of, about some of your work there? Yeah, I mean, so I'm mostly operating in the world of building social tools, which is, uh, you know, so um, I, I belong to a set of sort of globally federated and locally federated uh, communities that are sort of interested in self-valorization, self-determination, new solidarities, new forms of governance and so on and so forth. Um, and it's interesting because that those global connections have only really been able to be forged because we've had international travel. And of course, as Alex said, only certain people can travel internationally. And so it's been a challenge to make sure that these solidarities reach uh, anyone who wants to be part of these uh, networks, or well, I think we have succeeded in some ways. Um, I don't think that the sort of digital tools that we have or the technologies that we have um, are 
are sufficient. So, you know, I think I think technologies are necessary but not sufficient in 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 changing in changing these things. Um, and uh, you know, I think we sh shouldn't be too sort of techno uh, optimistic about about this kind of stuff. We do need the technologies, but we also need to change the social structures. And I think one of the issues we have is that we have such asymmetry around the planet, uh, whether it's economic or um, sort of geographic uh, privilege or resources, things like that, that we have these extraordinary sort of membranes that we call borders to try and to try and sort of hold uh, these asymmetries in place. Um, and I think a lot of uh, the tools that we need would be changed if we could actually just change uh, or uh, change the sort of asymmetry of how things are distributed. So, um, yeah, uh, so the communities that I sort of operate in uh, are, are mostly interested in sort of forming parallel, parallel institutions, parallel kinds of economics, uh, different kinds of economic solidarities. So there's lots of um, collaboratively produced funds and, you know, uh, collaboratively uh, produced income generation and so on and so forth. Yeah, that sounds it sounds challenging, but um, like we've got the right people thinking about it. Um, I know Lorenzo, a lot of the work that you do is in conscious innovation. So figuring out like what are ways that we can upend the way that we do things, and especially you know when things are motivated by profit, they tend to happen a little bit more quickly. And you often talk about your work as kind of the intersection of purpose and profit. Have you seen, um, you know, what are some tools that you've seen that are an innovative approach to making sure that these kind of changes move forward and are accessible to the places where there is inequality? And unmute. Sorry, Anna. If you're alluding to uh, corporations, uh, civic engagement, kind of like filling gaps where perhaps citizens feel disempowered. I would, I would look at that with a, with a grain of salt because I think historically speaking, uh, corporations have always been very much complicit with, uh, with politics uh, through lobbying and campaign uh, financing, things like that. So um, social good and profit seeking usually or historically haven't really been harmonized. Um, but, um, you know, a more appreciative kind of perspective on this is that uh, you can't um, neglect the fact that companies have been responsible for very rapid uh, tech innovations um, and all the digital inclusion at scale that happens because of that. You have the decentralized financial institutions as well um, that give citizens financial freedom, more equitable transactions, more transparency. And then obviously you have uh, very notable uh, CSR uh, initiatives uh, on the part of, of large companies that accelerate uh, the social and environmental agendas uh, very much connected to the sustainable development goals um, that impact directly and indirectly the lives and livelihoods of, of people all over the world. We're seeing that in living colors now uh, during this pandemic. Um, but again, um, uh, the more data that these companies kind of uh, uh, compile, um, uh, the more likely it is that um, they reach kind of like a, a, a moment of truth uh, where that data can be used for uh, profit-seeking purposes in detriment of certain values and principles um, that were perhaps at the core uh, at, at some point, you know? So, and there's also, the, the, because of this historical complicity with government, uh, sharing this data can uh, accelerate, you know, um, uh, arriving at a surveillance state. So um, I, I look at the role of government, uh, uh, corporations, um, uh, with, with uh, a grain of salt, with some uh, uh, Im important kind of footnotes, uh, because it's not a general trend um, that companies are, um, in a way, uh, tr trying to balance out uh, their pursuit for profit with the very necessary pursuit for uh, social good, uh, which is a shame because the data is showing that there's a symbiosis between the two. So to the extent that you are leaving a positive residual uh, into people's lives, uh, the more wealth you can accumulate. Um, so if, if, if companies are experimenting now, working at that intersection between those two worlds, um, but uh, a more macro view of the past few decades uh, would lead one to be very cautious with their optimism in terms of uh, the extent to which companies will really fill that gap. I feel like I've actually, this is a really, really great point. And I feel like Alex, I've heard you talking about this um, often 
um, this idea of too much power to, you know, too much thinking of consolidation of data and information um, by companies and governments. Yeah, I agree with Zarina. Technology will definitely not save us. Um, and I agree with Lorenzo that we, we face this uh, increasingly likely global surveillance state that is hard to escape. Um, however, I, there are some technologies that can help us. There are some technologies that are authoritarian, you know, big data analysis, uh, AI. These will be used by governments to learn and corporations to learn as much about individuals, to recognize their patterns, to know them better than they know themselves, to start to be able to predict what they're going to do next, to socially engineer, etc. But there's also a class of technologies that are incredibly empowering. Um, for example, encryption is, is one that I'll focus on. Uh, if you think about the idea that, you know, whatever it is, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, there was no way you could, you could communicate with someone else on a different continent or even in a city a few hundred miles away in a way that was private. Um, if you picked up the phone, uh, it could be tapped. If you, we go back even further in time, you had to send a letter. I mean, the, the idea now that you can use open source technology to send a message and coordinate and meaningfully communicate with somebody that's on the other side of the world is outrageously interesting and, and certainly allows us to transcend a little bit of those borders. Um, and more recently, we've had, I would argue, an even larger uh, sort of seismic shift, and that's the ability to move, uh, to transact in a way that's, um, that's pseudonymous and is not controllable by governments or corporations. So again, you could be sitting here where I am in California and I can send a payment to somebody in Beijing, um, it, it would be someone living in a police state or, or someone who lives in Nigeria or someone who lives in Brazil. And you know, in a matter of minutes, they can receive it. And you know, our IDs don't have to be attached to that payment. Our, we are not restricted by who we are. There's no way to discriminate against us. The system that uh, runs the payment server is not controlled by anyone in particular, it's decentralized. And that to me is just uh, something that we're at the dawn of understanding how that's gonna change our lives. Um, and that, that is, that's Bitcoin. So we have these major new interesting technologies made possible by encryption that I think hopefully will help us uh, uh, fight back a little bit against this growing kind of creeping, uh, uh, vacuuming up all of our data uh, surveillance state. So I haven't lost all, all hope. And I, I do think that um, these technologies allow us to, to transcend borders a little bit in a positive way. So how do we get, you know, people access to these kinds of tools? I mean, here I am in a very privileged state. Like, I don't necessarily even know how to access Bitcoin necessarily in my everyday life. Like, how do we empower people to go out and, you know, create that freedom of, you know, financial freedom, yeah. freedom of movement? Just, just a quick word before I see the floor. Open source software is criminally underfunded. And it's it's just not something that is sexy to fund. I, I, my organization, the Human Rights Foundation, has just started a, a developer fund for some of this stuff. And um, if you think about the Tor browser, which allows you to browse the internet privately, right? Um, it, it, it is it just fire, the, the team who runs it had to just fire a whole bunch of people. They don't have a lot of funding. Um, because with open source technology, you don't really make a lot of money necessarily from creating the technology, right? Because anyone can just copy it or work on it. So it's a, but it's a much more beautiful collaborative scientific endeavor for people to work on. So I think it's incumbent upon nonprofits, universities, and corporations to support open source software. And, and Bitcoin is obviously open source financial software, but there's all kinds of open source software that's very important. So I would just say that like, uh, hopefully there's like um, a responsibility among uh, that, that the private sector and the public sector can acknowledge in supporting this stuff. However, I don't think governments will be very excited to support something that undermines them. So it may have to come from individuals and civil society groups and maybe, and maybe the private sector. And that's particularly difficult in developing countries uh, where there's such a disproportionate uh, amount of power uh, with, with government, with the federal institutions. Uh, so to, to Alex's point, um, there are so many uh, core needs that are still not, uh, not met uh, in the case of a large majority of the Brazilian population, for example, that um, it's hard for you to see corporations, foundations uh, rallying around these innovations 
uh, when you have a government that is uh, deliberately working against uh, these initiatives. So it's, there's no incentive for companies to do that. They're regulated in a way that they're disincentivized to do so. Uh, there's also uh, the political implications of, of you taking the lead and trailblazing in this way. Um, and uh, frankly speaking, uh, those who most need uh, these digital innovations um, perhaps don't even know that these things exist. Uh, so we're, we're, we're at a very kind of uh, thinking a little bit of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, where even though this is their way, their exit strategy, um, they're concerned. Most people are concerned with things that are much more, that have much more of an urgent kind of uh, uh, appeal. Yeah, I think um, that resonates for me. I, you know, it's really, it's really tough to ask people to consider what it is to be, to consider the identities and the tools needed to be a, a citizen of this planet, um, given the struggles that like uh, uh, tons of people have in this planet, which is no access to water, no access to electricity, uh, certain like limits to, to technology. And so I think it's, it's really, really hard um, uh, to answer that question of how you how you get these technologies to people, let alone how do you get the information that this is an important thing um, to those people. And just to add on that, it, it looks like Lorenzo, I don't know if this is accurate, but by next year, close to 50% of Brazilians will have access to a smartphone, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, now, one could say that that's worrying because that gives the government essentially a tracking mechanism to see where everybody is. However, as we've seen in the United States, smartphones are cameras and they're very powerful and, and they allow us to document police abuse. So it's a little bit of a sort of a, a sword that has two sides. Um, but at the end of the day, it, 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 see, it would be hard to make the argument that the proliferation of, of devices like smartphones would be bad, um, generally speaking. I do think that the ability for us to communicate, the ability for us to document uh, and share and the ability for us to preserve some things in a private way, like some perhaps transactions and communications, um, would override the the like general ability for the government to like recognize. Oh, I can see Lorenzo; he's kind of here, and then he's moving over here. It's a little messy, and it doesn't work so well. So I don't know what your thoughts are, but I do think that again, it's not going to save us. But it's very interesting to see the rapid prolifer prol proliferation of these technologies, even among. Uh, you know, let's say poorer populations, even in the emerging world. I was looking at some data. Apparently in the next few years, there's gonna be, again, close to 50% penetration uh, with smartphones. Yeah, I actually thought that number would be higher uh, only because uh, Brazil is the second market for uh, social networking in the world for mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, things like that. Uh, so I would assume that, that it's more than 50% uh, but but I think you're right. I think uh, even though it's a double-edged sword, um, the long-term benefit of digitalizing um, uh, the population will, will outweigh eventual uh, risks of ill-intentioned uh, uh, governments. Um, I, but then again, I think it really has to do with the psyche of the nation. So it, it's it's kind of like um, Brazilians are very passive. You know, we go through so many crises, corruption scandals. Um, and yet we don't really kind of uh, put our lives on the line to overthrow these governments, uh, as we see in so many other countries in the world. Um, so we've been kind of struggling um, with a situation of victimization slash impotence with respect to the government. Um, we're kind of prone to whatever they decide to do. Um, and um, the, the legal mecha the enforcement mechanisms here in, in the country are very loose. So you know, governments can get away with anything they want. And you have kind of like a, a, a population that is kind of uh, hopeless uh, with respect to their power to kind of change these structures, you know? And so I think that has, that also plays into things a little bit. It's not don't just sell, technology, it's the people driving technology. Don't sell yourself short. One of the most inspiring things I've ever seen is a newspaper uh, from one of the major Brazilian newspapers during one of the military dictatorships. And they just printed, you know, a giant white, uh, you know, front page to protest the government. So I, I would uh, I would challenge that you are hopeless. Uh, I, there's just amazing stories from activists I've met in Brazil too, right? Oh, for sure. But if you look at our uh, our government since the redemocratization, <laughs> right. um, they, they leave a lot to be desired. Yes. yes.
Yeah, this reminds me of this quote that I read this morning, which is uh, national identity is less about self-determined power structure that built, built on identity. It's the other way around. National identities are built, are built and created by the power structures. Um, and, uh, and to some extent, I think this is why um, if we want to have some sort of agency over our, our identities, our collective identities, it's about who we surround ourselves with. Um, you know, and I think we do struggle with um, an individualism, which is um, to sort of put to put everything on. We sort of we put uh, responsibility on the individual, uh, but but really, like uh, who you are is is a sort of um, very much influenced by who you are with and who you are around. And so I think there is some uh, some wiggle room for agency there in in altering your identity. Uh, but it's very difficult if you're in a in if you're in a nation state where um, something something like that um, uh, is pervasive. Yeah, I just would I add, long term, I don't, I don't think we're here in 2020, but there does seem, of course, a trend, obviously accelerated by coronavirus uh, uh, for working remotely, um, especially with big corporations that may be thinking twice about the need to uh, have everybody in one big office all the time and pay exorbitant corporate real estate prices, uh, commercial real estate prices. But there does seem a trend of people being able to choose where they are when they work and therefore choose where they live in a way that didn't exist 10, 20 years ago, especially 30 years ago. And if all of a sudden people can choose where they want to live and all of a sudden people can move their money very easily from one place to another without all the bureaucracy and paperwork. I mean, I just remember going to 15 years ago, going to as a student uh, London and having to open a new bank account. And it was just like a huge hassle and to even just get a hundred dollars from one place to another. Today can be done in minutes. I don't have to ask the government. So in a world where people can, can kind of work, have more choice over where they work and have more choice over where they're going to move their money, um, it does seem reasonable to assume that governments will start to have to compete over citizens and have to offer more appealing environments and more appealing rule sets. Otherwise, people will leave and go somewhere else. So there is a little bit of this whole like voice and exit thing, I think, that we'll start to see in the coming decades. But unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I, I love this idea of um, a sort of self-regulating uh, sort of set of, of movements. Uh, I think it's interesting. So uh, when we were all having a private conversation, we, we sort of talked about this idea of like, you know, you could argue that um, sort of huge migrations around the planet might be very destabilizing for a ton of different reasons. But um, if you if your goal was to, to, to reduce sort of unnecessary migrant movement, um, there are other and probably more effective ways to do it than, than borders. Um, you know, you could try and make sure that everyone has their needs met, for example, or um, <laughs> various other things that I think some of the, the visa types that um, uh, the medical exchange have been working on might get towards. I think you also brought up this good point that, you know, a lot of our lives are, you know, especially with coronavirus are being lived digitally. Um, you know, populations are increasingly getting access to the digital world. Um, you know, this idea of actually the digital world being the defining factor of identity and your identity being defined by your digital community um, is also something to think about. And I think especially with things like Bitcoin, you know, blockchain, that might become more and more necessary. And I think, you know, the radical exchange talks about um, intersectional social data. Um, what role do you think, um, you know, these digital connections that we have um, as identifiers, what role would that play um, kind of going forward, especially as we think about like decentralized identity and we think about access to, um, you know, financial, um, financial tools that other, you know, otherwise might be more controlled by a government or an official identity or, you know, the banking system. Well, it used to be a, a, in the realm of science fiction, you'd read something like Snow Crash, right? And you'd have people who had alternated identities in a virtual universe, right? And, and of course, that, that, came, that came to be. Now we have that reality where you can just go on your computer and be somebody else, right? Um, and the pseudonymity of Twitter, for example, I, I know it gets attacked a lot. But I think it's very important that people be able to be somebody else and ha you have an avatar and you have a choice. Uh, 
and you can show the world many different faces. I think this is really powerful, um, uh, especially for people who, for whatever reason, aren't happy about who they are. You know, they can be somebody else, and that's really interesting and neat and I think beautiful. And <clears throat> that's what the internet has given us. But ultimately, uh, it did not allow you to pair that identity with economic power. Um, now you can. So now you can fully participate, for example, in a virtual world and make payments uh, that is not connected to your identity. So we're starting to actually start to increasingly disentangle our meat space self from what we can do online. And I know some of the uh, radical exchange leaders are, are interested in this idea of like, or that, or rather, they're not optimistic about privacy in the meat space. They think we're going to be kind of like increasingly surveilled out here, uh, out in the world. But online, we can preserve privacy, and that's a really interesting dichotomy. And I. I agree somewhat with that. And, and I do think that it, uh, uh, our days maybe are numbered of, of being able to walk in public. Um, you know, maybe we can wear masks and, and prevent some of that. Um, but uh, online, there are really powerful tools that will allow us to have these avatar identities and to protect them. And that's gonna be very interesting, I think, in a world where <laughs> otherwise there's gonna be a lot more restrictions. Yeah, I think I've been thinking a bit about, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, how could humanity have ever really gotten to a global citizenship mentality? And I'm not saying we've got there, but how could we ever have done it without this sort of period of like um, global travel that we've just gone through? And it may be that global travel is about to change in ways that maybe we're going to have to restrict. Uh, but but you could imagine that maybe there had to be this burst of of travel in order to to sort of allow humans to to form relationships with each other and coincidentally the internet was born during this same time which allowed us to sort of then build these electronic uh, based uh, relationships with each other uh, and so even if global travel has to change uh, we now have these um, infrastructures uh, sort of uh, to, to to maintain our sort of global relationships I think there's an essay called the silence of the commons I think which I think was written in the sort of 80s uh, which talks about how computers and um, you know, the language of, of the time was a bit janky, but uh, it talks about how the computers um, sort of serve as the same, same role as like fences and, and roads do in, 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 the, in the physical commons. Um, and in that it sort of determines the enclosures. And I think we, we are obviously seeing that, right, where we hang out in digital space is privately owned. And despite the fact that we uh, have alternatives, the majority of us still are on Facebook, we're still on these privately owned platforms, even though we have alternatives like Scuttlebutt and these other sort of spaces to, to be, um, we still go where the people are. And I think that is a challenge for us as we think about how our technologies allow us to be global and local, is that we, we, have, to, um, we have to have tools of the people, digital tools of the people. I would just uh, bring a complimentary perspective to this. I feel that, uh, um, oddly enough, perhaps these shelter at home policies have given us an opportunity to travel more, only virtually, as opposed to globally, because uh, global travel is very restricted, right? The, the disenfranchised people of the world don't have a passport, uh, as Alex said, don't have a bank account. They don't really know what's going on outside their bubble. Um, and uh, for digitalized communities that have been sheltered, um, they're spending more time, like it's kind of like the windows of the world have opened uh, in a way, and they're coming into contact with other realities, other possibilities, and in a way that's helping them shape their own identity or redefine their identities. So it's kind of like they're aspiring uh, for some sort of social ascension, for some financial freedom, for some, uh, for some inclusion, and for some justice that perhaps they didn't know they didn't have prior to the pandemic. So I think that might be a curious kind of legacy uh, from this difficult kind of uh, isolation that we're living through right now. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I'm giving a talk on experimental communities in China tomorrow. Um, and I, I would not have this contact if somebody uh, from that group had not walked through our doors in San Francisco, but that's all it needed, right? So we had this like moment of global travel and now we have the, um, sort of ele electronic uh, forms of, of relationships that's gonna, I think are gonna be very equalizing. Yeah, and I think so many more people are able to tune into this panel and the conference overall. I think it was supposed to be held in Rio.
Um, and so I still feel in some ways, you know, at least one of us is in Brazil, but um, it's, you know, it's such a unique time for it. Um, so I wanna go back a little bit. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion to the, you know, the digit, uh, sorry, the uh, financial element of it, because I think everybody here is in agreement that, you know, financial freedom um, a lot of times can transcend identity and um, is an important tool um, to kind of alleviate some of the current issues um, that we're facing. And actually somebody, um, one of the um, people watching the panel uh, brought up a really good point. You know, when you think about having a little too much freedom, when you think about Bitcoin and uh, the decentralized nature of it, the ability to do whatever we want, is there a risk that we sort of go the other direction? And rather than creating some sort of unified identity, we all just become individual uh, individuals and have a more individualistic relationship with society. Um, it seems like we're all forming these great digital communities. Like, it doesn't necessarily seem like a risk, but what are your thoughts um, about this? And what does it mean to have an individualistic society when it comes to identity? I would just say that the promise of something like Bitcoin is not that it's gonna change uh, the inequalities of our society. Anyone saying that technology is gonna solve inequality is lying to you. Um, however, what, what something like Bitcoin could, could help with is equality of opportunity. Um, it, 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 in history, uh, the wealthy could have things that, that everybody else couldn't have. If you go back several thousand years, they could go to the Library of Alexandria, for example, or hire a monk to copy books so they could get their word out, right? Pre-printing press, only the wealthy could do that. Obviously, successive technologies have made it possible for all, all of us to have a voice, right? And all of us to access information. Um, with money, previously, uh, if you wanted to make a change in the monetary policy of your country, uh, you had to be in the elite, right? Um, so today, there are like alternatives emerging where no one has any more privileges than anyone else. So even if you own a lot of Bitcoin, you can't change the rules of Bitcoin. That's not how it works. Even if you're a giant government or a corporation, you can't change the rules. You can't prevent Lorenzo from using it or whatever. And that's a very interesting dynamic, I think. But again, it, it doesn't solve anything to do with who has how much of an asset or um, you know, you know, the fact that there's people who have a lot and then some people who have very little. That's not, I, I don't know, maybe you all feel differently on this panel, but I don't, I don't really feel like technology is gonna solve that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And you know, I think um, I live in San Francisco and there's a lot of conversations about technology. And I generally think technologies, whether they have sort of more utopian or dystopian trajectories is really about the, the social and cultural um, ecosystem in which they're embedded. And if you have a lot of um, uh, asymmetry in power or economics, uh, they are often have like dystopian sort of uh, outcomes. And so I think, um, you know, to to the individualism thing, I think I think this is why I sort of focus a lot on, uh, you know, my goal is to make sure that all humans have their needs, uh, you know, the right to a good life for everybody, because I think until you have that, any technology uh, is going to be used uh, to keep people apart, uh, to oppress other people, and so on and so forth. And I think, um, you know, for me, that's a foundational principle that uh, will determine the future of how we use all technologies. I would just add to what they both said, <clears throat> that you can't really look at the long-term impact of a technology without looking at the state of consciousness uh, of the person or the people who invented it and the person who use it. Uh, and some people will use it from a place of ego and some, of, uh, some will use it from a more altruistic perspective. As long as, so as, long as we're humans, uh, we're gonna be prone to going one way or another. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I, I also think, you know, something we haven't quite touched on yet is um, the difference between our given identity and the identities we may want. Um, and how do, we, how do we gain agency over building identities that serve us versus the identities that we were given that maybe don't serve us all. Um, uh, and I think, you know, we get to decide uh, or we get to at least think about what kinds of identities we want and what, what might serve our sort of like local needs and our global needs. Uh, and uh, an individualistic approach to that I think won't serve us because it's very difficult to change your identity alone. We're social creatures. Our identities and our norms are interdependent. 
Um, and so if we want to think about uh, what does an identity uh, that will serve our collective futures, we have to do that in some group setting. And that's, uh, I think, clearer than ever now. Uh, we've been working from, we've been operating from a, uh, an individual mindset for decades, and here we are picking up broken pieces. Um, so if there's one thing that's super clear is that the future is collective. We just need to qualify what that collective means. Yeah, and just to um, build on that a little bit, I again, you know, we're kind of stuck in the situation where uh, obviously corporations and governments control how money works and how people can get access to it. And that's not going to change anytime soon. What technologies like, or in, in Bitcoin's case in particular, what it makes possible though, is like that you can have an option, that you can have a lifeline, you can have an all, a way out if you, if you wish, if you wish. Um, you don't need to ask anyone's permission to acquire some and engage in that particular economy. And that's not something we've ever had before. And as it gains adoption and popularity uh, around the world, you'll, you'll continue to have a different way of doing things if you wish. And that, that to me is going to be very interesting to track. And it very much falls in line with this conversation about uh, identity and, 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 and borders because Bitcoin is borderless and is not tied to your identity. So as it becomes more of a thing in the coming five, 10 years, as it seeps into more of our society, um, it, it could have an effect that's very interesting and positive when it comes to um, blurring borders uh, and and you know allowing people to transcend their their you know identity as such as printed on their passport. Um, we've got about ten minutes left um, in the panel, and I just want to kind of focus on a few additional questions that come I have come in from the readers. Um, so. Alex, you talked about this idea of um, open source software just not being um, supported enough. Uh, should we dismantle IP laws as a counterweight to supporting more OS software? What kind of long-term effect can that have? And is that is that a solution? Yeah, I, well, I think the open source software community takes the perspective of, we don't really care what the government does. Uh, we can assume that whether it's the Chinese or American government or whatever, that the government is going to have its own interests at heart and not, not ours. Right. So it is probably not going to dismantle uh, IP law for, for various reasons. There's a reason why this like uh, website SciHub, which is uh, run by like this Kazakh woman, which is pretty amazing. Uh, uh, it provides free access to all these uh, university papers. Yeah. It's like, it's funded via Bitcoin because if, if you try to give her a donation via bank account, your bank account will get closed. So like the powers that be do not want this to exist. Free academic information for everybody. How terrible is that, right? But that's not what they want, right? They want like these corporate monopolies want to have control over scientific papers and they want to charge you an outrageous amount of money for it, right? Or they want to restrict access to people who are enrolled in a particular university to make going to university more desirable. So you're starting to see, you know, you started, you saw this with, uh, like Bitrin, of course, first, or, or rather, you know, or in, earlier. And um, you're not going to stop this. People are going to be able to increasingly start to create alternative technologies that allow them uh, to share beyond IP law. Um, so I don't think the question is so much should, should governments dismantle or not. It's do you want to work on a project that makes it irrelevant? And that's, that's the goal here is to make things like that irrelevant, at least from my very obviously activist perspective. I, I just want to add to that, like, <clears throat> um, this is definitely not my area of expertise, but I, I, uh, I do think we could uh, have more nuanced sort of ideas around sort of economic enclosure, um, around things that are created uh, in common for common use. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I think we've seen this in the Creative Commons license and copyleft. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, the use for which something uh, is allowed uh, is predetermined by whether the sort of social and economic logic um, uh, that it was created in. I think that uh, could be a really powerful tool in, in, in some nuance there. I feel very much represented by Alex and Zarina's answers.
Wow, I guess we're very radical then. <laughs> so another question um, that we sort of touched on, um, but I do think is important to uh, think about as we um, go forward with these, the, you know, the alternate identities, the avatars, um, what is the risk of creating disinformation and vile behavior? You know, what is the trade-off between having that alternate identity that gives you freedom, but also trading off privacy and other forms of freedom. I think it's the same double-edged sword principle, right? It can be used in both ways, depends on the intent. Um, and I think like every innovation, it's part of an evolutionary journey and there's a certain degree of calibration um, that we're gonna have to make and there's gonna be uh, some uh, some type of regulation, even if not the type that we're used to, uh, but something that will incentivate a certain type of behavior as opposed to another, shall we say, or protocols or agreements, even if they're not laws. Um, so we, we're, we're prone to, to, to both sides of the story. Uh, question is, you know, what, what state of consciousness will we embrace uh, when scaling uh, these, these opportunities and these possibilities? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. You know, I think if you look at like centralization versus decentralization of the media, you can see that like, you know, once upon a time, there was just a sort of king who just told you how things were and that's all you sort of knew. Um, and that might not serve you, but at least it was a coherent message. And now we have um, completely sort of decentralized forms of information absorption. And so, you know, you can go out and basically find the, the media that, that just affirms your uh, position already and so we've become very siloed in these sort of cultural um, cultural bubbles now I don't think it's you know it's hard to say either of these is is good uh, and I think the challenge of our time is to work at uh, something that captures the, the good parts of both of these things yeah I um I say this as someone who due to what I'm doing, I get a lot of like threats and I work with a lot of human rights activists who get a lot of threats from bot, you know, egg, egg bots on Twitter and things like that. But even that said, <clears throat> I think that you can look to, I'll just use Twitter as an example. I know they get criticized a lot, but I think some of the things they've done have been kind of smart in as much as how do you preserve pseudonymity, which again, I, as I was explaining, I think is very important for us moving forward if we don't all want to be controlled. Um, you know, how do you preserve that while also uh, preventing sort of the worst excesses of, uh, of sort of abuse and disinformation? And, and verification is interesting. Uh, I think that every, look, all these different people can reach out to you on Twitter, but you know that some of them are verified and, and some aren't. And okay, that helps give you an immediate uh, place to start when you're thinking about assessing what they're saying. And then when people respond to you on a thread, the people who are verified go to the top. And there, there's interesting kind of like um, choice architecture that's been made in Twitter that, that, I, that, is, that is, I think, done, has been done tastefully. And again, just like choice architecture, the idea that you want to put the healthy food in front of somebody and put the candy up top, but still allow them to take the candy if they want, um, you can still read the comments from all these abusive people, but they might be hidden. You have to unclick them to see. And I think that's that's been made in good faith that these experiments, and I, I think there are ways to do it. Um, so we have about three minutes left and I wanted to see if each one of you can give our audience just one takeaway of what are things that we as individuals can do right now to move this issue forward. Uh, Serena, you look excited to answer the question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I, I am hesitant to sort of uh, tell people what to do, but I can give you a perspective from where I sit, which is uh, as someone who uh, lives in prefiguration, which is, you know, um, trying out, trying to live the, the world that you wish existed. Um, uh, so I think my take home for people would be to try and think about who you are, try and think about the identity you've been given. Um, think about how it's affected your psychology and whether you consent to that. And if you don't consent to it, uh, find some people to, to figure out how to break out of that. Now, I know that's not going to change uh, borders right now, but I do think uh, we have to change our sort of internalized sense of identity all the way from the individual to the to the sort of small social unit all the way up. Uh, and I think we have to start to 
collectively develop mentalities that allow us to be a collaborative species rather than a competitive one. Lorenzo? So I think my answer would be more in, in, in terms of uh, celebrating kind of the way that we've been engineered as humans. Uh, there's so much about uh, the way this body works and its organs work and our brain works and the heart works um, that we don't really kind of uh, uh, talk about and use in our favor. Uh, you know, humans have an incredible ability to feel empathy for other people, to feel solidarity. Um, and, and those things can translate into incredible degrees of collaboration. Um, and yet we don't explore that as much as we should because we don't put ourselves in situations where we empathize as much as we should. And I think, again, coming back to the point that we are here sitting on our couches um, with the windows of the world blasted open in front of us. Um, that's an opportunity for us to come into contact with other realities and to feel things because of that. Uh, and to understand what role we want to play uh, in this world that we're part of so that we can make our own individual journey as worthwhile as possible. Um, so my advice would be what works for me, which is to subject myself to situations where I'm coming into contact with different realities and feeling something because of it. And that feeling will drive my decisions in terms of what I want to do, who I want to be with, and the kinds of projects that I want to kind of be involved in. Um. Just to conclude, I'd say that if you care about identity and you wanna protect your identity, but you also want to see more open borders and more open world, privacy is very important for us to preserve, um, both for us to have our own identities and, and be confident with them and also uh, create <clears throat> multiple parts of our identities, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some immediate action items you can start doing today uh, by using open source software to, to just start to explore it a little bit. Um, you know, try moving some of your chats onto Signal off of like things that are obviously surveilled and, and used uh, for, for marketing um, and, and that are, you know, sold to third parties immediately. Think about checking out something like the Tor browser. Even if you don't use it, it's kind of neat to see that it exists. Um, uh, invest some time in learning about stuff like Bitcoin, not, not your money until you understand it. But uh, but you know, think about these things because they're incredibly powerful tools that that I think will um, will help us preserve privacy longer than it otherwise would have been a, a, allowed and available to us. Oh, that's some amazing advice and really, really amazing conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining and everybody that watched. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I'm excited to hear um, what everybody has to say the rest of the day, um, and you know, excited to continue being this digital community for the next 48 hours. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care.